Good afternoon, you're watching The Full Scotties. Thanks for joining me. I'm Hugh Stewart, and for the next hour or so, I'm going to discuss some of the main topics of the last week with two excellent guests. Joining us from just north of Glasgow, we have Rona Mackay, who's a member of the Scottish Parliament for Strathkelvin and Bears Den, just in the north. Good afternoon, Rona. Can you hear and see me okay? Yes, absolutely, yeah. Great, thanks for joining us. And also from near Bridgend in Wales, we've got digital and media specialist Hugh Marshall, who's, uh, I'm glad to say, able to join us this afternoon. Can you hear and see me okay, Hugh? I can. Thank you, Philip. That's, for the that's great. Thanks. So we're going to be talking about a lot of uh, interesting topics f for both of you, and we will finish up looking at the media and uh, changes happening there. But first of all, I'm going to go over our update from Russia's war against Ukraine, which today comes to day 193. And first, the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant has been disconnected from its last remaining main power line to the grid and is relying on the reserve line, the International Atomic Energy Agency said. Previously, there had been reports the plant in the southeast of Ukraine had been knocked offline in the early hours of Saturday amidst sustained shelling that destroyed a key power line, according to Russian-backed authorities in the area. Sweden has said it would provide liquidity guarantees to Nordic and Baltic energy companies worth billions of dollars in an effort to prevent a financial crisis sparked by Europe's energy crunch. The Russian energy company Gazprom has said that Siemens Energy is ready to help repair broken equipment from the Nord Stream 1 gas pipeline, but claimed there was nowhere available for them to carry out the work. Gazprom's announcement that Nord Stream 1 would not restart came after G7 finance ministers said they planned to implement a price cap on Russian oil to reduce what they called Russia's ability to fund its war of aggression. The European Union expects Russia to respect existing energy contracts but is prepared to meet the challenge if it fails to do so, the European Economic Commissioner Paolo Gentiloni said. An eight-year-old child has died after Russian shelling in the southern Ukrainian region of Mykolaiv on Sunday morning, according to Hama uh, Zamazieva, the head of the regional council. Russian troops launched overnight rocket attacks on Kramatorsk as Slovaniask in eastern Ukraine, according to the governor of Donetsk region, Pavlo Kirilenko. Ramzan Kir... Kadyrov, the leader of Chechnya, is reported to have said he plans to take an indefinite and long break from his post. The Russian former president, Dmitry Medvedev, has accused the West of playing chess with death in its support for Ukraine and urged Western countries trying to take advantage of the conflict to push Russia into a new round of disintegration. Ukrainian forces have likely achieved a degree of tactical surprise with the ongoing counteroffensive, according to the UK Ministry of Defence. It said Ukraine had taken advantage of poor logistics, administration and leadership in the Russian military. Russians paid the final respects to Mikhail Gorbachev, the last leader of the Soviet Union, in a ceremony held in Moscow without much fanfare and with President Vladimir Putin notably absent. OK, it's a roundup from Ukraine. It continues, and we will continue to report on it. So first, let's turn to our two guests today, Rona Martin from the north side of Glasgow and Hugh Marshall uh, near Bridgend in Wales. And we're going to look at, first of all, the main, the main story this week, of course, is the disaster which struck Pakistan uh, from floods um, and possibly more monsoon w uh, rains to come, I believe. So we have heard, of course, that one third of the country has been underwater. So the first question, which I'll put to you f to begin with, Rona, is that uh, should the developing nations do more? Do we have a responsibility to help with this kind of disaster? Thanks, Hugh. Um, yes, we have a huge responsibility to help um, with this disaster. I mean, the irony is that, that places such as Pakistan and, and others that are being hit in such a tragic and terrible way um, are not being hit because of their climate abuse, but because of ours in the Western world. And um, so we have a massive responsibility um, to help and, and to help urgently. You have to remember, of course, the UK government have slashed their foreign aid, bud foreign aid budget, which is, um, you know, shocking. Um, but um, 
you know, the, the, there are there are many ways that that we can debate, uh, donate um, through um, aid agencies, etc. Islamicrelief.org.uk. Um, our government give ten million pounds um, to the International Development Programme, three million pounds to the Climate Justice Fund, and a million pound annually to the Humanitarian Emergency Fund. Um, but you know that that's that that's great. The, Help is needed absolutely now, and we must try to prevent this happening again. The only way we can do that is if we clean up our act. Um, I'm pleased to say that you know Scotland is um, you know punching above its weight in, in, in terms of climate change. Um, we um, you know we we generate the, the cheapest electricity and um, via renewables. I think everyone knows that, about a hundred percent almost. Um, but you know. Try, just ironically, we pay the highest charges in Europe to feed into the national grid, and then we have to buy it back at the second highest price in the UK, and with the highest standing charges, that's 50% above London's. So none of that makes sense. I'm not an energy expert, but I know that uh, that just, you know, to anybody, that's there's something far wrong with a system like that. But we really do have to do more. We have to take seriously, um, you know, what what we're doing and all the the, the, the uh, damage the oil and gas uh, does, um, and and all these things have a knock on effect and have been having that for decades. Um, and, and all these things have a knock on effect and have been oh, I'm sorry I had a delay on, that, on my <laughs> sound there now yeah. turning to Hugh so first of all Rona has raised the question of renewables which we can produce ourselves so I know we're going to talk about Pakistan but in Wales you, you have um, a great deal of hydropower same as Scotland and also the p potential of using tidal power um, so do you see that this is the, the occasion when politicians should be saying we need to move away from fossil fuels towards renewables um, yeah, de most definitely. Um, Wales generates twice as much uh, energy uh, than it actually uses. So obviously, you know, Wales is a, um, a an energy generator. A lot of the renewables come from wind. Uh, we've got offshore and um, inland wind farms, uh, but we've also got the question of nuclear, and that's quite a bit of a, a hot topic in Wales because obviously on um, Ernest Morn. Uh, will uh, they're planning on trying to build a new uh, nuclear reactor there, and there's opposition to that. But but definitely, as Rowan is saying, you know, we just need to accelerate the process of um, of not being reliant on on fossil fuels because you know what's happening in Pakistan is only going to get worse. Because one of the things I didn't realize with Pakistan was the fact that they you know it's, they call the north of Pakistan the uh, the third polar ice cap. It's where most of the sort of glacial ice is. Um, and it's a ticking time bomb because as those glaciers melt, it's creating lakes that if they burst their 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 banks, you know it's you know it's we're looking at a third of, of the country under under water. But you know th that is going to decimate the country and you know and kill millions of people potentially. But definitely, you know we need we need to look at energy uh, within you know Wales, Scotland, and and within the UK. And I don't know if you saw. Um, our next Prime Minister, Liz Truss, on Laura Koonsberg's show this morning, um, and you know she she just couldn't give any answers to you know to the to the energy crisis. You know she's going to make an announcement within a week of becoming Prime Minister, um, but you know we've just got to accelerate the process of 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 going over to renewables and becoming less reliant on 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 gas um, because you know waiting for nuclear, which is something that I oppose personally. It's just going to, it's not going to take, you know, it's not, it's, it's going to take so much time. Um, things like solar and wind can be implemented and developed quickly, and we just need to accelerate that process. Yes. Yeah, so, Rona, so Hugh has pointed out then that the, the alternative is re renewables. And in fact, he's really underlining that fossil fuels are at root the cause of this disaster. And uh, it is a disaster, isn't it? So, the environmental disaster we've been talking about, and which Greens have been warning about, is here now, isn't it? So, why is there no political response? Why is the world not saying we've already stored up all of this immense heat from fossils fuel burning? And why is the world not saying it's now the time to move quickly over to renewables? What's the political uh, logjam? Well, I mean, I think it comes down to the, the age old. Um, uh, answer which is greed really and and, and um you know money and um the fact that we haven't done it before now um is yeah we, you know we absolutely should have but I, I go back to saying that we are 
we're leading in that. Scotland is leading in that respect um, with our program of uh, renewables um, and and climate um, measures. But um, yeah, I mean, it's it, it's it's. It's, it's really, really shocking that we have, um, you know, we're in this situation now. We have this legacy for our children um, and we've left this far too late, um, but we have to absolutely accelerate the, um, you know, the reduction in, in oil and gas and um, and fossil fuels because, you know, they, they are the key drivers, amongst, amongst other things that we have ignored. Um, there was a very interesting programme on and I've forgotten what channel, but it was on recently called Big Oil versus the World. Um, and I highly recommend anyone um, to, to watch that. And it's um, basically about, you know, going back decades, you know, I'm, I'm talking, you know, 60s, 70s onwards, when the, 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 the global oil companies knew of the problems that, that their um, development was causing. Um, and researchers and scientists were coming up with the evidence of you know what was actually happening to the environment, and that's fifty years ago we're talking. And all the bosses of and one in particular, boss of, of Exxon, they were just climate deniers and said you know this wasn't happening, and making as we all know, you know billions and billions of pounds of profits at the expense of the planet. In my opinion, the people who knew about this and denied it and carried on regardless uh, you know are criminals and I, I think they should pay the price and if they're still still with us they should be bought, brought to um to justice because they knew this was going to happen it's happening now and um you know our, our, our next gen us and our next generation are paying paying the price and it's just tragic to watch the effects this is having on, on so many countries as Hugh's pointing out there's um although this is a disaster there is a potential for it to become even worse and so we, we won't be surprised if further disasters happen around the world. But the, the problem is now how to pay for it, how to pay for the fact that really a substantial amount of Pakistan has been destroyed, doesn't it, Hugh? What do you think is the feeling in Britain, which I heard yesterday that something like 13 million has been raised by the Disasters Emergency Committee, but that's, to coin a phrase, a, a drop in the ocean. You've got a third of a very large country has been devastated. So... It, it's going to be billions, it's going to be trillions, isn't it? Are British people prepared to put their hands in their pockets or prepared for a government to spend billions and billions in reconstructing Pakistan? Because that's what it's needed, isn't it? The country has been devastated. I, I think there's a, there's, a, there's a section of society um, who are willing to do that. Um, you know, I think any sort of decent uh, and sensible person would, would support that. But unfortunately, you know, we've got a government um, and we've got an incoming prime minister who has been courting that section of society um, who, you know, who were basically trying to make us despise people from, you know, from foreign lands and especially people of, you know, certain religions and, and based on the colour of their skin. Um, you know, of course, we should be helping, and you know, the government should be helping. But, but you know, we've got a problem here where we've got a, you know, a media that pushes an agenda and has been, you know, the the fact that people like Farage was given, you know, sort of so many appearances on Question Time just to to peddle hate, and that's the issue we have now. Is you know, when governments should be doing the right and the decent thing, um, it's difficult for them because of the climate that's been created over the years by, you know, by the right wing elements of the media and, and the political landscape. Rhoda, there's clearly a need for international solidarity. And as I said, um, I, I just can't imagine the cost of rebuilding a third of Pakistan, but it's not up to the people of Pakistan to do it, is it? It's up to all of us. Is the Scottish government able to, um, to um, encourage the sort of serious international effort that's needed? Well, you know, we have said after independence we would double our international aid aid bill aid um, program um, because we would have the levers the levers to do that at that point. Um, so, you know, there's only just so much of of um, financial support that the Scottish government can can give. But of course, we're doing absolutely everything we can. And um, yeah, I mean, it's it, it. I think the majority of people are quite in favour of helping countries, and and it's very difficult to watch in your TV every night what's going on in Pakistan, just the same as watching what's going on in events in Ukraine. But 
Um, you know, we are, we are, we're in the middle of a cost of living crisis, which is which is going to get, get worse, it would seem. Um, so it's it's hard, you know, it's hard for, for the ordinary person to say, you know, yeah, I'm going to start, you know, giving, um, you know, big donations because not that many people are in a position to do that. But certainly companies, global companies and big businesses that are should be using some of their, their profits um, to do that. I think that they have a moral obligation to do that. Um, because I, I think, you know, the ordinary person would love to do it, but are often not in a position to do it. So the Scottish Government would do its best to take part in the international effort. So we'll move on then from that story, but that's the um, disaster which has struck Pakistan. And as our correspondents have said, there will be further disasters and we know what's behind it. Uh, because of a fail failure of the rich countries to quickly enough move away from fossil fuels. Uh, so um, we're going to move on to... Another story that's linked to that, the cost of living crisis facing uh, Europe, but in fact particularly facing UK. While rising costs might be an, an irritation for the wealthy, the poorest in society face hunger, ill health, and in fact uh, death over the winter as they struggle to afford heating and eating or the rent. Uh, for some, the crisis really is literally about the cost of living. Should we be talking about the price of living crisis. Let's begin with you, Rona. So um, does anybody in politics have a real solution to the, the, the serious crisis which everyone's going to be facing this winter? Well, I mean, it's it's unprecedented, to be quite honest. And, and it's, it's, you know, it's the result of, of many factors, not least of which the Tory government, of course. Um, and, you know, it, it, it shouldn't, it doesn't need to be like this. It should not be like this. Um, other countries um, throughout Europe are not suffering in the way that we are um, because their government are taking steps to um, to, to, to try and sort things. Um, you mentioned um, the Laura Kunzberg programme with um, Liz Truss uh, on it. This, this. Um, and, you know, you just had to listen to what she said to get an idea of, or what she didn't say, to get an idea of the situation and the crisis that we're facing. She quite clearly said she thought there was too much focus on the distribution of wealth, um, which is a you know quite a shocking statement, I would think, for, for any uh, incoming prime minister to make. She said she'd give help one week uh, if she becomes prime minister, which she probably will tomorrow, um, but she gave no detail of what that would be. She talked heavily about um, growing the economy, which means nothing to people who can't pay their bills at the end of the month and are actually terrified of the coming months ahead. It's quite insulting to, to, to go on like that and how the growing economy benefits everyone. Actually, no, we're in, a, we're in a crisis. She didn't say it was a crisis. All she said was it was a serious challenge. I think they're just very, very out of touch um, with with how people, the, the mood of the people and um, you know they're, they're they're playing political. You know we we're, we're about to get a prime minister that was elected by a, a fraction of society, and of course, which Scotland ha has absolutely um, proportionally no say, and we don't we don't elect Tory governments. But um, so I, I think um, you know the, just as an example, uh, you know tax cuts, um, which she is advocating, um, the poorest would would gain seven pounds out of that. And the wealthiest 2000 now she thinks that's okay you know she defends that so that's the sort of challenge that, that we're up against we shouldn't be here and um you know it, it doesn't have to be like this but unfortunately we are and there is going to have to be serious targeted help given to people who simply can't can't pay their bills and that's the majority of people in the uk uh yes you Ronan was referring to um, a clip which I saw from the Coonsberg interview this morning where Liz Truss said, and on the one hand, she said there's been too much emphasis on redistribution. On the other hand, she said that Britain has low economic growth. But um, if I'd been Laura Coonsberg, I think I might have been inclined to ask, well, how come if Britain's got low economic growth, how come it's also the most unequal country in Europe? Um, did you see a, a, a missing question there? If, uh, if there's been too much emphasis on redistribution, why has it not happened? Yeah, well, it's, it's, it, it, you know, it was it was a depressing watch, basically, not just because Truss was not saying anything, but unsurprisingly, um, Coombsburg just gave us such a such an easy uh, ride, which doesn't bode well for the uh, for the future. But but it's clear. Well, you know, the, the frustrating thing is, you know, that there are you know 
Ronan was saying, you know, sort of, I don't think Scotland has voted the Scottish majority since the 50s. You know, in Wales, we've never elected a Tory majority, yet we're, in, you know, we have Conservative governments um, inflicted upon us. Um, and unfortunately, it, you know, this, the, the fact that we're in a union that is made up of, um, you know, sort of four component parts, but 84% of the population live in one, one of those countries, it, it's just impossible to have you know, a different way of thinking. You know, Scotland has more economic levers than Wales does, but, you know, the, you don't have, you know, the economic levers needed to be able to intervene here. You know, and Wales is, you know, basically, where, where, you know, the Welsh government basically just administer um, the health and education budgets on behalf of the, of the Conservative government. So, you know, it's clear the rest of Europe, you know, c c have taken measures. You know, Spain have made, you know, rail travel free, um, France, I know they've got more nuclear power there, so they're in a better position. But you know they've they've frozen the increases at four percent. And and the reality is, while all this has been going on, the energy companies have been making huge profits. Uh, and we know that you know gas prices have actually started going down again um, in, in the last sort of week or so. But you know, as with all these cases, it just takes a hell of a long time for this, you know, for the benefits to be passed back on back to the consumer. Um, I don't know if you saw uh, Edwards of Conway uh, butchers up in in, in the north um, of Wales. You know, they published. You know, they spent one hundred twenty nine thousand on energy last last year. They've just received a quote uh, this week of seven hundred eighty two thousand. You know, going from two and a half thousand to fifteen thousand pounds a week. So it's it's not just you know it's going to affect us you know all as individuals, but you know we're, we're literally going to see businesses you know all going out of business. And trust thinks that the answer is to you know grow the economy. How can you grow the economy if businesses are closing down left, right, and centre? It just doesn't make sense. Yes, incidentally, Rona, we also, um, on that point that Hugh made about growing the economy, we also pointed out last week when Roger Mullen was on that the UK economy has grown much more sluggishly than the rest of Europe. In fact, the gap in economic growth yeah. between the UK and Europe has been growing. And as we've just pointed out, it's not because there's been too much redistribution, because that hasn't no. happened. Uh, the other issue I wanted to talk to you about was um, the energy and the Scottish government's limitations and powers. Scotland proposed a while ago to set up an energy company, but that, as I understand it, would have been an energy retailer. And uh, if they had done that, they would have themselves have had to pay those high prices. So um, is the Scottish government too limited? Does the Scottish government need the power to actually um, take over, if you like, a, a production company? Because it's the production companies. The people actually get the oil and gas out of the North Sea. Uh, that's where the profits are being made, isn't it? Not in the retailers who are the middlemen. Yeah, absolutely, Hugh. And, and, and you're right. I mean... We simply do not have um, the powers to address address this properly, and it's something that we we could obviously undertake to do um, with urgency um, after independence. And it's just another you know compelling reason why um, we need to be able to do these things um, and have the powers to do them. Um, we simply can't do it with one high tide behind our back. Um, so I think, um, yeah, we, we, we absolutely do need to do this and we have to we have to have our own national energy company. Um, and, and absolutely, you know, we, I keep saying how far ahead we are with renewables and, and we have been on that trajectory for some time. And in that way, we could expand, we could, you know, we could um, uh, make the most of our fantastic national and natural resources. Um, just just going back to, to, to something that, that Liz Truss, again, another um, um, hypocritical sort of um, nonsensical statement that she made. She was, you know, she was saying that um, oh, we we don't uh, rely too heavily on Ukraine for gas, but and then in the next breath, she was more or less saying that was the reason for the the the, the crisis and the cost of living um, a crisis that well, she wasn't calling it crisis, the challenges that we're facing. Um, so, you know, it, it it makes absolutely no sense to anybody, and I think the public. When people, you know, with all the, the, the factors that the public hear about the, the reasons for the cost of living and petrol going up and, and everything else and energy prices, and they hear about all these things, all they hear in their head is the billions of pro pounds of profits the energy companies are making. And, you know, you don't need to be an economist to know that that doesn't square up. Some The, the system is wrong when those profits can be paid out to shareholders 
and um, you know people are, can't even heat their homes or feed their children. So um, I, I think that's the thing that sticks in the forefront of people's minds, regardless of all the underlying factors. The fact that billions of pounds of profits are being made by energy companies um, just doesn't make sense. Now, Hugh, you said earlier on that Wales, like Scotland, is an exporter of energy and increasingly that's from renewable energy. Is there any demand, any support in Wales for a nationalisation of energy so that those profits can be used for um, social benefit and not just for the uh, shareholders? Yeah, and, and I think it's, it's interesting because obviously the situation in Wales is, you know, a complete um, opposite of Scotland because we, we have a Labour government, uh, but they actually have a cooperation agreement with um, Plaid Cymru, the Nationalist Party. Um, Plaid Cymru are proposing uh, setting up an e um which is mm. a which we would be a, a you know a Welsh owned uh, energy company. And, and we know you know from opinion polls, and it's not just in Wales and Scotland, but across the UK, you know that people support the you know the renationalisation of of energy companies. Um, so yeah, you know, I think there's definitely a desire for it, but there, there are some things I think you know the governments in Wales and Scotland could be doing that they that they you know that we're not doing. It are things like um, insulation programs. You know, we've been talking about this for 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 donkey's years. You know, about you know getting houses insulated so you know we're saving energy. You know, from a personal point of view, we're very fortunate where we are. Um, we had an air source heat pump uh, combined with solar solar panels. Uh, installed um, a couple of years back as part of a research program because we live in the middle of nowhere and we were very reliant on LPG um, gas and we've seen our you know energy bills come down you know come down substantially and we're not going to be impacted as badly uh, as other people so there are opportunities here where we could be you know with renewables with solar with wind actually you know creating new manufacturing industry that you know that is going to save money because if we went out and started installing air source heat pumps uh, and putting solar panels on people's roofs tomorrow, you know, the reliance on gas, because pe people need to remember as well, there's, there's two sides to it. It's the gas that's heating people's homes. Um, but, you know, in, in Wales, the energy that's created in Wales, half of that comes from gas fired uh, power stations, which is obviously gas that's been imported um, into Wales. So, you know, we, we need to become off gas because obviously you know we coal has gone now you know we've we've, we've closed down the the uh, uh the coal power stations or I, I again i believe liz trust was you know would be a supporter of that in the short term to to, to cut down reliance on uh, on gas but definitely i think you know people want to see key services not just you know sort of energy but you know we've seen with transport as well you know that they should be under public ownership they shouldn't be uh things for you know for for shareholders to make money from well, that, that would be a, a radical agenda. Uh, Rona, has the Scottish National Party said that they're in favour of um, nationalising energy, and I mean at the production level as well as at yes. the retail sales level? We 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 would we would we would look to do that. You know, obviously we, we would only have the the power to do that after independence, and so we'd have to look at the whole um, structure of of the way that we um, gain and 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 use energy, and that's something that's definitely on the agenda. Yeah. OK, so that's uh, the price of living crisis, the price of staying alive in Britain, uh, facing uh, steeper rising costs than other countries in Europe and um, with a government less inclined to cap uh, price rises. So we'll see what the new government brings uh, brings to the table when they're created later on in the week. So um, you, of course, already said that we expect that Liz Trust will be unveiled as Prime Minister tomorrow. We don't know, of course, that uh, here the Conservative Party hasn't told me, but we believe that the um, the, p the poll from inside suggests that uh, Trust is the clear leader. So if that happens tomorrow, so uh, we're looking at the end of the Boris Johnson reign. Boris, who wanted to be king of the world, ma. Um, so first of all, let me ask you, Hugh, do you think that we've heard the, the last of Boris Johnson? Uh, sadly, no. Uh, I think it's been covered in some of the uh, newspapers uh, today that there are, you know, conservative um, MPs out there who are already, you know, planning votes of uh, no confidence uh, or votes, you know, confidence votes in Liz Truss in order to try and, and get 
got um, Boris Johnson back. And, you know, it's clear from the polling that was done with Conservative members, had Boris Johnson been on the ballot, he would be tomorrow uh, <laughs> being elected uh, the Prime Minister again. So, sadly, I don't know, he, he, you know, I know we're going to discuss Trump l- later, but it's almost like it's, cr- it's created a cult. Uh, you know, th- there's no explanation as to why people are, you know, in awe of this individual who has basically spent, you know, the last two years as Prime Minister, you know, lying his way, you know, time and time again. It, it's just, it's beyond belief. And sadly, he's, you know, like Trump, you know, you hope that he would disappear. Um, I, I fear because again, you know, he, you know, how is he going to make his money? You know, what's he going to do after leaving politics? You know, this is his best way of trying to get back into favour with his, um, with his sponsors and 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 you know friends in business who he's obviously been looking after their interests. Yes, I wonder then, uh, Rona, if assuming Liz Truss is the winner, how is she going to do the balancing act between, on the one hand, doing what the country needs and uh, which we've just discussed, and on the other hand, doing what the right wing of the Conservative Party wants? Do you think she's going to be, continue to? Uh, well, well, well. So far, she's obviously been appealing to the Conservative right because she needs their votes to get the job, right? But um, how is she going to use that to win support in the country? Do you think she can do it? I, I, I don't think she'll even try a balancing act. I think she's just going to want to keep her popularity amongst um, the right wing uh, voters in the country and the right wing of her party and, and the, <clears throat> the right wing cabinet that she she will um, announce. So I, I, I don't think she has that kind of um, you know social moral conscience to actually think about um, the, the, the rest of the country. I think she's um, entirely um, you know playing to her own gallery, and I think I think she will. I think she'll continue to do that. Um, at the start of the the um, Laura Kunzberg program, Emily Thornby was, Thornbury was asked of you know kind of what her um, what was her good points were what um, oh no it was what her failings were I think it was anyway she was asked her opinion of um, of Liz Truss and she said she was thick skinned not into detail and lightweight. And that's quite scary, you know, when you think a woman uh, who will be given so much power um, and and demands, you know, so little respect from most people, apart from that that that, that small uh, right wing portion of, of voters and um, a, you know ministers that she will appoint. And I, so I, I genuinely don't think that um, she's going to be going to be too bothered about that. I think she's going to want to shore up her own popularity. If she goes to the country with a general election, she's um, she's got you know this is how she thinks she can do it. Um, and you know you you quite I totally agree with everything else that you you know what Hugh was saying about. Could Trump make a comeback? I mean, it's just horrific to think that that could happen. Quite honestly, the most corrupt prime minister this country has ever seen, um, and it's madness, you know, to think that he would. But but sadly, I think that's the territory that we're in. Um, and you know, um, he he may well. He's 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 an exhibitionist. He's deluded. He's completely delusional about his own abilities. And I think um, you know he will be probably waiting in the wings to see Liz Liz Truss fall. If, if if she makes any more gaffes and um you know he's 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 prone to gaffes himself but i don't think that's going to stop certain elements of the party from from wanting him back and and, and this is that it's like a, a farce quite honestly but a very very serious one and a tragic one and it's the it's one of the reasons why um we and in my opinion wales should you know go off the sinking ship um, and 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 actually say no, we we can do things much better. It doesn't have to be like this. Yes, a be- an exhibitionist, um, a criminal, and uh, not wanting to give up power. Are we talking about Trump or Johnson? We'll look at uh, Trump later <laughs> on in the program. Um, but the next question I'm going to put to you first, Hugh, is about the the economic crisis. Okay, Liz Trust doesn't think it's a crisis, but <laughs> it is. Um, well, we don't need to go over the the extent of the UK's economic problems, but um, um, whoever takes over tomorrow, anyway, uh, are they going to have to? Um, deal with unprecedented problems and are they bound to fail whether it's sooner or trust are they going to be in power for a very short time well i, I, I think you know as ron was saying I, I think my concern is that you know trust is clearly just basing you know 
she's in full sort of not, you know, fully aware of the fact that all she needs to do is appeal to 30 odd percent of the, the population, uh, specific, you know, particularly in England, who, you know, who've got, who've got, the, who've got this narrow worldview that's been fed to them by the, uh, the Daily Mail, uh, you know, and, and, and the rest of them. Um, because, you know, so at, it doesn't matter about the state of the economy. The fact that people are more worried about people coming across the channel in small dinghies just makes you just aware of how awful the situation is. You know, the, the economy, you know, the situation going on, you know, I mentioned earlier about the butchers, you know, we know that, you know, the pubs and hotels, you know, just thinking about, you know, sort of schools, you know, I, I'm, I'm a, um, a, a governor in, in a primary and a secondary school. And we're just thinking now, you know, we, we're going to have, to have a meeting next week to discuss with the local authority, what do we do about our heating bills? Because obviously, you know, our, our school budget, 90% of the budget goes on, on staffing costs. But if you're looking at, you know, heating bills and energy bills going up to that extent, you know, there's a potential, you know, disaster here on our hands. And, you know, we've had 12 years of the Conservatives. We're going to have another potentially two years or, you know, more worryingly, a snap general election. And by some miracle, she manages to sort of, you know, sort of scrape by with a, um, you know, a small majority or supported by the uh, unionists in, in Northern Ireland. Uh, and we could be feeling facing really, really dark times because, you know, this needs serious people with, you know, with, with, ideas and thinkings because you know the current economic situation and it's, and it's not just you know the, the you know the the you know the energy crisis just economics you know the capitalist economics they just it just not it's not working yeah the the economy is slowing down as i said earlier on the uk economy is, uk economy has been growing much slower than others in europe but it's um tipped to head into recession and will probably be in recession for most of next year. So that's that's part of the election timetable anyway. So uh, do you agree, Ron? It looks unlikely that Liz Truss would call a snap general election. She doesn't need to until the spring of 2024, I think. But next year is going to be dreadful, isn't it? She's not going to want to call an election in the middle of a worsening recession, is she? Well, well, that that's the the, the, the sensible thought, and it's, it's what I would think too. Because I, you know, you would think that they would absolutely crash and burn if if they did go, if the Tories went to the country anytime soon. Um, but you know, I wouldn't rule anything out. I think um, you know, uh, I think you you you'd sort of learn to be surprised in politics, and certainly with the Tory party, they they just do things their way and. You know, she she may want the validation of of being a new prime minister, etc. But certainly the polls are not showing it would end well for her if she does. Um, but it just depends on how you know much support she's going to get from within her own party. Um, she, I suspect you know um, she will be um, how can I put it advised um, by by others because I'm not sure that she's a, a you know a forward thinker anyway. So. I think she will get pressure put on her, and it just depends um, on how all, how all that works. But so I, I wouldn't rule anything out. I think um, you know, in some ways, yes, uh, you know, it'd be great if if she went to the country um, and had a general election because I'd I'd love to see the, the back of the Tories. But um, but I'm, I'm not sure that you know they they would this would be the time for them to do it. Now, the other thing we can't rule out is a Scottish referendum on independence because that's actually come back onto the agenda. And it's in the Times today, and I think this has been leaked from the Trust camp, that Westminster might actually steal the thunder from Nicola Sturgeon and themselves call a Scottish independence referendum, but introduce barriers as such as uh, that the majority of the population, the majority of the electorate to, um, votes yes, not just the majority of the people who actually turn up. Um, so let's go over to, to you first of all, Hugh. What do you think of the prospect that the, um, the SNP's position, which is to have a referendum next October, might actually be used up by the UK government, but with conditions attached? Well, that clearly, you know, the UK government is just going to try and do whatever they can to ensure that, um, you, that the, you know, the will of the Scottish people isn't um, carried out. You know, when you look at sort of devolution in in Wales, you know, it, it was won by the narrowest of of margins. Um, you know, it was under under ten thousand uh, majority who voted yes to devolution. But you know, as I keep you know reminding people, 
you have a vote. If you don't use that vote, then you allow other people to make those decisions on your behalf. So, you know, th that's the way democracy um, works. And, you know, Scotland should be allowed to carry on as, you know, as they are. But, you know, as we've seen in, in other places in the world, you know, as we've seen in um, Catalonia, um, you know, it's of national governments don't like the idea of, you know, of smaller countries that make up their part um, having have, taking their own um, decisions. Um, but what, what I don't genuinely understand is what, what are the benefits of, of the union? You know, I've yet to have anybody explain, you know, a single benefit of, of the union. And it, and it strains the language that's used by um, conservatives, you know, and unionists about, you know, the preciousness of, of the union. And I think if you look back historically, the union, you know, at one time probably was, you know, a fairer situation when, you know, the UK had a much smaller population and the, the populations of Wales, Scotland and England, um, you know, the differences weren't as huge. Like today, 84% of the population of the United Kingdom live in England, you know, and they are the people who decide, uh, you know, on, you know, what happens. And you know, people are saying, well, you know, England, you know, if Scotland and Wales have their own governments, then England should have one. They've got one. It's called Westminster. You know, they've had it for years. So, you know, I hope Scotland, you know, make the right decision uh, and just take, take it into their own hands. And I know in Wales, support for devolution uh, for, for independence hasn't grown enormously i think it's between you know it's around 25 to 30 percent uh mark um but i think you know we we need to have a discussion about the future of wales uh because i think people just need to be informed but i think people are, are aware now that the current model and the current situation of you know not voting conservative yet having conservative governments you know forced upon us it can't go on mm -hmm. Now, one question that strikes me, Rona, about this proposal, we don't know if the Conservatives are going to go ahead with it, but the proposal that you, the UK government takes over the independence question, is that that actually puts to bed, surely, the argument about whether there should be a referendum, because for years, well, since, since 2014, <laughs> Conservative and Labour politicians have said, yes, you can have another referendum in 50 years or something like that. Uh, so that argument's blown away, isn't it? If they now say, yes, you can have a referendum next year, but under our terms. So they can no longer argue the once-in-a-generation uh, line, can they? Absolutely, absolutely correct, um, Hugh. And, and I think, I think first and foremost, it shows how desperate the unionists are and, and how worried they are that, you know, we, we, will, we will win this time, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm certain that we will. It also puts to bed the idea that this is a voluntary union, which they keep on telling us it is, and it's clearly not. Or that we're a, you know, na we're a nation of equals, or, or nations of equals, and that includes includes Wales as well, because we're clearly not, and and this this has highlighted it. Also, it's not the first time um, they've tried this. They did it in 1979 in the first devolution referendum, um, which we actually won, but they moved the goalposts and we lost. And and so it's exactly the same tactic that they're trying again, um, and I think um, you know. It just goes to show how utterly scared and desperate that they are at this point. They will do anything. They will do anything to thwart our efforts um, for a referendum and to deny democracy. They've just ridden a cart and horse through democracy um, in, in all in all areas. And this is another area where they want to do it. They don't care. They want to do the same thing. They will trash democracy. So we'll see if anything emerges from that. Uh, so the suggestion has been that if the UK government holds um, a Scottish referendum, uh, they would have a requirement that 51% of all registered voters uh, vote yes and not just those who, um, uh, who turn up for the vote. OK, so um, we'll see if anything happens there. Now, we're going to move on now to the, the story. We can't stop talking about Donald Trump <laughs> these days. So let's look at the issues now. We reported the other night that uh, following that raid on Trump's Mar-a-Lago home in Florida, thousands of documents have turned up which really shouldn't have been there. They should have been under lock and key safely in the White House. Uh, so this means that uh, there's a good chance that uh, Donald Trump will himself be indicted 
I believe it's under the Espionage Act. Uh, we did say, um, I wasn't joking when I said earlier on, criminals, two criminals. So obviously Boris Johnson has been found guilty of criminal offences and Donald Trump is accused of serious criminal offences under the Espionage Act. Let's go to you first of all, Rona. If this goes ahead, do you think that means that Trump has finally finished? Can he run for president in 2024 if he's behind bars? Well... <laughs> Well, you, you wouldn't think so. I mean, it, it astonishes me that it's even an issue that we have to be talking about, you know, because everybody, um, any normal, sensible person knows that he's, you know, that he's corrupt. He has no respect for law. He's, he thinks he's above the law. Um, and he is, um, you know, utterly bereft of any any moral compass. Um, but I think, you know, we should never underestimate the, the, the sort of power and um, influence that right wing extremists have. Um, and I guess we go back to, to um, uh, Boris Johnson in the, in the same vein with this. Um, you know, just just when you think, you know, things couldn't get any more farcical, they do. And the fact that we're even talking about Trump coming back to power after all the crimes and misdemeanors that he committed, um, and it's now, been, now proved that he has, but he still has a massive following in America. And, and I despair about that. I mean, I think it's... Um, it's just not good for, certainly not good for America, but it's not good for, for the world or, or society in general when someone like that can um, basically hold hold the reins of power. So, uh, I, but my heart of hearts, I don't think he could come back. Um, I think, you know, I think that would be a long shot. But as I say, uh, you know, n never underestimate the power of his, um, his uh, followers. Okay, Hugh. Now, let me just emphasise, first of all, Hugh, that um, Donald Trump has not been found guilty of anything. Broadcasting Scotland is not making any accusations, but there is a real chance that the Attorney General might prosecute former President Trump for having uh, apparently thousands of documents in his possession, which should have been uh, under lock and key in the White House. He doesn't have any reason to have these top secret documents. And in fact, the FBI revealed, revealed that several, in fact, dozens of files labelled confidential, top secret, have nothing in them. So we want to know what happened to these documents. So there are questions that Trump has to ask. Um, I want to move on to the question of what the, what the Democrats and what President Biden say in response to Trump. It seems to me in the last week that um, President Biden has come out fighting. He's made a speech the other day where he said that Trump and his MAGA supporters are extremists. Is this a shift in policy from the Democrats? Are they no longer frightened by the, the Trump bandwagon and uh, are they fighting back? I think it, um, it's interesting. I've got, I've got a few friends in, uh, in the United States and you know, I follow their commentary on what's going on. And what's been interesting in the last uh, few weeks since the Mar-a-Lago raid is the fact that you know, Biden was become, you know, was unpopularly seen as as being, you know, sort of too old um, and, you know, sort of, you know, just out, out of touch. But apparently what's happening in the States is even Democrats uh, and people who were disaffected with Biden are now coming back into the fold because, you know, they're, they're not going to vote vote for Biden. They're going to vote against Trump. Um, so, you know, actually what's happening now is actually playing against Trump, you know, it is polarizing the situation, but it does appear because, you know, there was there were thoughts that, you know, with the midterm elections that are due, uh, I think in, in November, that the Democrats, you know, would lose, you know, a lot of um, seats. It appears now that that may not be the, be the case, uh, so that, you know, there is a turnaround. Um, you know, I think the Democrats do face a challenge because Biden clearly, you know, isn't seen as, you know, somebody who's doing, um, um, a good enough job. Um, and I think, you know, just the fact that he wasn't Donald Trump isn't enough. Um, you know, they, they need, you know, they need leadership in the, in, in the States. Um, but, but, but it is a challenge because, you know, I don't know if you saw um, Trump's um, speeches last night, you know, it was just full of the same old nonsense. He was, you know, he was coming out against um, electric cars, you know, he was he's in favour of, you know, the, the oil and gas lobbies. You know, he's basically just on the side of all the wrong people. Um, and, you know, some people, you know, they love it, they lap it up. You know, he feeds on, you know, the base sort of nationalism and racism of some people. Uh, and sadly, you know, as we've seen in, in the UK, you know, it, it, it works to a certain extent. 
Yeah, Ron, let's, uh, let's look at this idea of, po of uh, populism and what exactly does populism mean? Obviously, all politicians, including yourselves, want to be popular. What's the difference between popular and being populist? And is this the end of populism in that kind of um, Trumpian way? Well, again, I'd, I'd love to think so. Um, you know, po po populism is, is it's like almost like a virus that spreads and, mm. you know, um, and, and it, it makes people um, quite delusional, to be honest. Um, so um, I, I just think, you know, it's, it's the lowest common denominator for um, govern governing a country. Um, I, I agree again with what, what you, you were saying, you know, about, about Biden and, and not being good enough just to be elected, not to be Trump. And they need they need strong um, leadership. And, you know, even, you know, even though you didn't agree with, with some previous president's um, policies, you could see that they had a gravitas and that they had some, you know, uh, brains and they were they were, um, you know, they, they were capable of leading the country in a in a reasonable manner and you know people like um trump are just it, it would be it's hard to believe you know that, that if someone had told us that he would be president and all the things that he's done and 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 you know um, purports to support you, you just wouldn't believe it you'd say that's too far-fetched and that's where we are so um I, I i just think you know pop yes of course we like to be popular but but you must have principles and he doesn't have any now, Hugh, I was wondering about the idea of um, of populism in um, in Wales and in England. Is it? Uh, do you think it's correct to say that Brexit is an example of that populism here? Um, yeah, I, you know, if you look at someone like Farage, you know, he's he's a very eloquent speaker. He, you know, he's very effective at what he what he does, and you know, he does go after you know populist issues. Um, I think you know the, the the main thing is obviously is I, I still think the majority of people are, are decent and want um, you know to, to live in a society that's fair and just um, and I think it's it's a bit unfortunate is that the people are almost being conditioned to you know sort of to despise certain sec sections of society to be to be um, jealous of them you know because you know the reality is you know sort of. Government, you know, conservative governments, you know, are there to favour business, you know, and, and the wealthy. You know, it's, it's been the case all the way through. Yet they're very, very effective at getting people who were actually suffer from, you know, the the, the economics of the conservatives favour um, to get of getting their support. You know, we saw in the last general election with the, you know, the red walls up in the in the north of England, how those turned from being, you know, traditional Labour seats to being conservative seats. And, you know, and it was populism. It was Boris Johnson. It was this, you know, this lovable bloke going down the street, you know, who was cracking jokes and, you know, just talking nonsense. Uh, and that's what won the Conservatives, an 80-seat majority. It wasn't the policies, because we've seen in the last 18 months, you know, despite, you know, of COVID and, and now, the, you know, the, the war in, in Ukraine, um, Boris Johnson, he didn't have any policies. He had no plans, you know, and he's, he's still trying to make out that, he delivered Brexit. You know, Brexit is you know is an unfolding disaster. You know, it's just getting worse and worse and worse. And we talked earlier about the the UK economy growing slower than the rest of Europe. We've seen you know the once proud English pound and how that's suffering now against compared with the euro and um, and the dollar. Because you know, I think during the last um, independence referendum, you know, so much was made about you know or what currency would Scotland use. Well, I'd imagine by the time the next um, uh, referendum is held, um, being you know having the euro will actually be economically far more beneficial to Scotland than having the pound. Yes, that'd be interesting. That's another debate that no doubt we'll return to. But Scotland has at least those three currency options. Uh, let me just clear up one thing anyway on on Brexit, because of course Scotland and Northern Ireland voted to stay in Europe, Wales and England have voted to leave. So it's two two. <laughs> um, now. Do you know if but it's it was, true it was that a very small it was a it was a very small majority. It was about eighty thousand, which is the population of right. um somewhere like Wrexham. Okay. Yeah, I was what I was going to ask you is that can you say it was the influence of English voters who have moved to no. Wales? Because the, the, uh, I think there's much more yeah. English in Wales than there are in Scotland. Although even English people in Scotland, I believe about a third of them would vote for independence. Yeah, I think I think that's that's something that's been pushed by certain uh, sections of you know sort of the 
the the independents and nationalist sort of sections of um in wales you know i'm half english you know and I, i've you know got no issues with uh being you know my my english heritage the reality was the people who voted for brexit were the ones who were told that you know foreigners were going to come and take their jobs that you wouldn't be able to get a hospital appointment or you know appointment with a gp because of all these foreigners would be coming in i had a conversation i, I live in a village called ponticama and i remember talking to a couple of people who were going to vote brexit because of immigration and i asked them what immigration you know where where, where we live you know the, the only immigrants who live in in uh, in the village uh, are the people who you know who run the uh, the local takeaways but and you know when when you pointed that out it was like, oh no but they're different and that is the thing you know they were fed this you know lies i remember seeing um a campaign video by um you know sort of but by leave that was showing you know sort of you know your, your elderly granny not being able to get an appointment in a gp surgery because it was you know it was literally full of foreigners and that that's what they've done you know they've, they've found something that people that pushes their buttons you know the people you know for some reason thought that you know the brexit would basically stop immigration that's all that for me that's what the majority of it was about and unfortunately there were there were plenty of people in, in wales who were fearful of their futures who you know who bought that line yeah, that's interesting. Thank you. Now, obviously, we could just devote another half an hour to that because there is a growing campaign uh, in England, in fact, to re rejoin uh, Europe, but that doesn't have any support from Labour. Uh, I'm afraid we'd, I'm, just, I'm just going to leave that there. We don't have time to discuss that now. So while you're on, Hugh, I'd like to move on to our final topic tonight, which is this afternoon, which is to discuss the media. Now, of course, in Scotland, as with Wales, we share the, the same media, basically, as everyone else in Europe and uh, in, in, in the UK. We have very centralised media based in London, really. It's been very difficult in, in Wales, isn't, is it not, to create an alternative media? Is there any future, do you think, for print media away from the big owners? I think, you know, again, you know, this week is a very sad occasion because obviously 18 months ago I was involved with the launch of uh, the, the National Wales, uh, which was a sister title to the National um, in Scotland. Uh, unfortunately, due to the economic situation, uh, subscriber growth had slowed and reversed and uh, advertising revenues fell uh, and NewsQuest, the company who published it, decided that they were no longer willing to, you know, to carry the uh, the losses that was ongoing. So, you know, so we've lost uh, what was for me, you know, personally for me, but also for Wales was important. And I think, you know, in Wales, it's, it's different to Scotland. You know, you have national newspapers, but you have Scottish editions of them. We don't have that in Wales. The most popular newspaper in Wales is the Daily Mail. Uh, the second is the Sun. The most popular radio station is BBC Radio 2. So people in Wales are basically fed news that is, you know, that is for a UK pop. Uh, population and as i've said before you know 84 percent of that is in england and the media does basically speak to that 84 percent so i think print print generally is in decline i think the whole industry is facing a crisis i think we're going to see with the cost of living crisis you know the people are cutting back on you know you know if you having to choose between heating and, and eating the last thing you're going to do is buy a newspaper or t or pay a digital uh, subscription and we saw with the national that that's what brought it to to an end i think we're going to see a lot of these you know titles um go uh, you know i think there's a genuine threat to the, you know the future news and you will be left with just the some of the big titles who've got you know billionaire backers who were willing to basically fund um their you know their existence and you know so you know there's a genuine threat here to to democracy um and we need to start building new models and i think the fact you know what 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 you're doing with um you know with broadcast scotland shows the the shift now people just aren't reading newspapers we've seen the decline over uh, over the last 20 years but people aren't reading news online you know, people who visit websites, they're not going there to read news. So you know, those companies who have those websites, you know, that's why you see so many things, about, you know, online on your news services about this is what's on for sale in the middle aisle of Aldi this week. Or, you know, these are the top 10 fish and chip shops in Porth Cowell or, or in Dundee. They're just becoming content platforms because that's all they're interested in is page views and news doesn't generate that. So unless there's some intervention from a government point of view, 
you know, there's going to be a massive democratic deficit here. And I predict in the next 18 months, we're going to see a lot of these titles close and a lot of journalists lose their jobs. Yeah, print has been in a crisis for a number of years. And of course, newspapers have got smaller, they've consolidated, they've shared content and uh, that decline continues. Um, so, Rona, what do you think is the future of, uh, of both print media and broadcast media in Scotland? Um, the Scottish Government, of course, and I dare say, Hugh, it's the same with the Welsh Senate. We don't have any control over media. Again, it's centralised in London, as I said. Uh, but what do you see at the moment of the, um, uh, the likely paths of development of media, good and bad, in Scotland? Well, first of all, let me say, um, you know, my sympathy goes to, to uh, Hugh and, and the demise of, of his newspaper because, um, I mean, I, as someone who worked um, as a journalist um, in a national newspaper for more than uh, two decades, I hate to hear of, of newspapers failing and, and news outlets failing. I think it's it's tragic. But, um, but sadly, I think... Um, for print media, I think they're living in borrowed time, to be honest. Um, I think, uh, apart from the economic arguments of it, I think um, there's a demographic involved in that, you know, young people do not buy newspapers. My children, my grandchildren, my nieces and nephews, um, they just get everything on their phone. They, they will not buy a newspaper. So even, even the big titles, I think, are living in borrowed time. Um, and we have to, you know, that has is, is the reality of, of where we are. Um, so I think, you know, I, I think that I agree again. Agree with everything Hugh said about uh, about the content um, of of um, some of these websites, etc., and and the news out, uh, news um, websites and how it's you know it's clickbait. It's the lowest common denominator. I think that, that there is there's definitely the way ahead will be um, quality, you know, digital and and online news um, and you know stations you know pioneering like like yourself broadcast scotland who um who are saying no we can we can do it we can have a sensible discussion um and i think that's um you know that's that's definitely the way to go um the, the, you know there's there's another argument and again there was a, a program on um david dimbleby um presenting a three-part program called days that shoot the bbc and it shows you just how um the influence for decades and going back to Margaret Thatcher's time, um, how the BBC public broadcaster was manipulated um, by her and by her Tory, Tory government um, and to a shocking degree. Um, and, you know, so, so so we have to be very, very careful. And, and I think the media has to retain its independence as much as possible. Um, our party has not had a good relationship with the media um you know, traditionally, and um, we have the national up here, which is um, which is doing well. And but I suppose you, you could say, to some extent, preaching to the converted. But um, you know, for independent supporters, but 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 we've kind of learned to 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 live with it. We we want to engage in respectful debate. Papers like the Daily Mail and the papers who papers who you know are, are you know quite blatantly hostile towards us. I don't think it's worth even thinking about them i think we just we just ignore them um and and try and concentrate on on reasoned arguments because a lot of people um that you know they are hungry for for good debate and they have questions they want answered and and, and they want it to be done in a, a non-argumentative way so i think that i think it has to be digital and i think um in the future is digital and broadcast um but it, but yeah i mean changes changes do have to be made and maybe we're just at the start of that curve. But I think for print media, I think, um, sadly, and I, and I hate to say it, but I think the days are, are definitely numbered. Yes, I share your regret. I remember that I used to enjoy reading the, the Glasgow Herald, now named the Herald, but um, uh, increasingly, of course, it's becoming an anti-SNP paper. So I think that's a fair comment to make, don't you? Uh, so I regret, if you like, the the great old days of, of print newspapers, but they have gone, haven't they? That's finished. They have gone, yeah. The, the circulations are absolutely plummeting. I mean, when I worked um, for a national newspaper, it was, you know, three quarters of a million sales, etc. And it's a fraction of that now, um, you know, and, and that goes across the board, um, pr pretty much whatever paper um, you look at. And, and it, it really is, I think, just a, just a matter of time. And it, and it is a shame because... Um, I mean, I, my father was a journalist. I, I was I'm a journalist, and um, I hate to I hate to see it happening. And and as Hugh says, so many good journalists um, and people who 
and young people who entered the profession because they wanted to um, are, are, are going to struggle, I think. But you know, if we if we shift the, we shift all our energies into to new um, new media, then perhaps you know that there is there is still a future there for them. Yeah, let's take up that topic of new media and uh, digital channels, uh, Hugh, because um, the phrase that keeps occurring to me here is the idea of citizen journalism. Now, I'm a bit un- a bit wary of that because you talked about quality. People do need news. People need to know what's ha- happening. They need to be informed. Um, but there, of course, is a plethora of websites, some good, some indifferent. And, um but do you think citizen journalism is the way forward, or will the market eventually sort out the good and the bad, and uh, will that allow uh, quality journalism to come to the surface, or is it always going to be pushed out of the way by populist rubbish? No, I, I think you know there is a future for the media, but it has to be in a in a different model. I think what people don't realise is that print has has been and still contributes to those media companies. Um, revenues and profits, and as that decline has you know has accelerated, um, they just haven't been able to pivot to um, to make money out of of digital. Um, you know the, the National in Scotland are successful. You know they've got thousands of of digital subscribers. Um, but again, as I mentioned, you know the cost of living crisis. You know when you start looking at six ninety nine or whatever a month going out of your bank account, it's going to be one of the first things people are going to um, get rid of. Um, so I think you know the the, the 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 risk is that there's going to be a, a, a sudden and mass sort of closure of 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 the industry. So we need to make sure that we've got plans in place to create something um, that you know to, to fill that gap when it does go uh you know i think you know citizen journalism and hyper locals you know there are good examples of hyper locals in in wales there's one uh, rexham.com that, that that does excellent work but then we've got a couple of um you know blogs news blogs in wales um who are just basically just full of poison and and nonsense you know and basically those blogs are run by you know sad um you know old individuals who've got nothing better to do uh, with their time so that that is the risk you know, we, we need quality journalism. We need people who've, you know, who've trained, uh, you know, to, in order to how to speak the truth. You know, news should be based on fact. You know, you need to separate opinion from uh, from from news. And I think, you know, there's a real need now for, you know, the need for quality, factual based news is needed more now than ever before. Uh, but people need to value it. So, you know, what. I, you know, I've launched now Talking Wheels, which is a new venture that's going to try and develop a platform that combines lots of things, video, audio, um, digital, and also print, because I think, you know, there is a future for print because some people want that tactile. They want to be able to sit down and read something, but it has to be a completely new model. So that's why we're setting up as a cooperative. So it's actually owned by the, the people as opposed to mm-hmm. um, owned by, you know, and answerable to, to shareholders. You know, that, that's the key thing that people realise you know, what we're trying to do is for the for the good of Wales and for the benefit of, of society. Yeah, but that's excellent. So hey, please keep me informed of developments there. You and I just met on Twitter this morning, actually. We're now Twitter friends, so let, please keep in touch and I'll, uh, I'll follow that. Thanks. Now, Rona, uh, a few years ago, uh, the Scottish government produced a paper on the, um, on a state of broadcasting because the BBC itself in Scotland has been falling in uh, public acceptance and um, public support. And uh, it was, I think, 12 years ago, something like that, the Broadcasting Commission said that uh, the people of Scotland are being let down. Uh, has the Scottish government subsequently been doing enough to support um, the kind of uh, initiatives that Hugh was talking about. I know the Scottish government does not have power over broadcasting, but is there anything you could do to to support um, better inf- information and better balance and better, um, well, giving people the ability to um, listen to what's happening and to look at the information in context? Is it, could the Scottish government do more to, to make sure our own voters are informed? I mean, I mean, we're always looking to do more, um, and we'd love if there was there was a better balance, um, because we have been let down. There's no question about it. We've been let down um, by the BBC and others in the past. We, we, we're slowly um, getting there. I mean, I'm 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 very hopeful that for for the next referendum, we will not be subjected to the amount of bias that we were during 2014. I think I think lessons have been learned there. Um, you know, we have we have some excellent um, journalists up here. 
uh, and excellent broadcasters. And you know, it, it, sometimes criticism is is um, aimed personally at them, and it's and it's it shouldn't be really because um, you know the people don't know their own personal um, political persuasion. But um, the the um, the impression is that you know we, we we don't get a fair media. Our independent sporting parties don't get a fair media up here, and that has been true. And I, I'm optimistic that that, that can change. Um, we don't want to you know be at war with anyone. We 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 want to work with the media and get information out there. But um, it's it's not it, there's no overnight solution to it. I would say. Okay, so problems in the media, the print media combined uh, decline continues, and uh, the national Wales is in difficulty as we've uh, we've been reporting. Sad news indeed. Thank you for uh, bringing us up to date on uh, on Rackhew. Well, uh, thank you for sticking with me. I thought we'd been maybe overrun a bit today because we do have um, a lot of topics to discuss. So I'm going to draw it to an end. Somebody's just been saying on my Twitter, by the way, runner, that we should maybe try and do a very quick edited summary of the main points of the news because nobody, well, people don't have an hour. To, well, I'm sorry, it's been an hour and 10 minutes now, but thanks for sticking with us. Um, so I'm going to wind up now. So it's been a, a, a pleasure to talk to you, Hugh. That's Hugh Marshall joining us from Wales, and I hope we'll speak to you again. And Rona, Rona Mackay from a bit nearby, north side of Glasgow. So it's been a pleasure. First time I've spoken to both of you, so I've really enjoyed talking to you this afternoon. Thanks for being thanks. on. Thank you. So yep. I'll wind up. And of course, as Hugh was saying, we have a problem with subscriptions. There weren't enough subscriptions coming in to keep uh, the Welsh National going. Uh, this TV station is entirely run by subscriptions. And so thank you if you are one of our subscribers. Now, here I've got a suggestion. Tell a friend. Why don't you bring a friend next time? Let's double our numbers of, of subscribers and then double again. We've got a target. If we had 10,000 subscribers, we'd be professional, not exactly full time but we'd be able to do something like 12 hours a day from lunchtime on to about 11 at night and uh, and if we had 10,000 subscribers we would do that and by the way to go back to the subscriber who talked to me earlier on no I don't mean 12 hours of news 12 hours listening to me and um, what we hope to do if we get um, that support is a full range of programs we want to do cooking we want to do music we want to do culture we want to do comedy and as soon as we have the right number of subscribers we'll do the full range of things you'd expect from the media. Um, so please, if you haven't subscribed, have a look at our website. And starting at £5 a month, if you could be one of those uh, 10,000 that we hope to grow, we'll try and turn Broadcasting Scotland into um, something like a full-time alternative broadcaster for the country. So that's it from me. Thank you once again to our guests, Rona Mackay and Hugh Marshall, for joining us today. Thank you for watching. I'm Hugh Stewart. I'll be back at Scotland at 7 tomorrow. Bye for now.